we're just about to release the third version of our, our, our software, this time AI driven. And we're going to be, we're going to be let, letting others use our software in a SaaS-like manner. So we're talking to some large retailers and FMCG brands uh, here and in the States about using our software to run clubs for them. Um, I, think, I think that's me in a nutshell. Nice. We're about to release the third version of our, our, our software, this time AI driven. And we're going to be, we're going to be let, the hell's happening there? Can you hear me? I mean, that's never a bad thing, but... I mean, it was so good, I wanted to hear it again. That was the live that started playing in the background. Well, that's embarrassing. Anyway, Gareth, over to you. Give us your 60 seconds. Cool. Uh, we're a technology business, and our chosen uh, industry that we operate in is recruitment, because let's face it, it's a bit of a crap experience for most people. So we felt like we could do something a bit different. Um, and we do do things a bit different. We ban recruitment agencies from using the technology because that's what users asked for. Uh, we don't match on job titles, we match on skills. So we're, you know, a job title can mean anything to anybody, right? Head of happiness, what does that mean? But people use it. So we look at a variety of skills and experiences that make up that personal uh, and professional profile. And then we match it to the requirements of a job. Um, we've also just released a new feature that allows businesses to um, push targeted uh, employer branding content direct to people based on their professions. So it's a bit of a, um, a recruitment slash employer branding, employer marketplace. Nice. Okay. And just uh, like going a little bit off script here, but just so people are uh, contextually aware, how many employees do both of you have within your companies? 25. Um seven okay cool and so let's start it off with a with a, a relatively easy one and I'll, I'll start with you first gareth give me an example of the worst experience you've ever had of being sold to in a business context in a business what yeah. other context is there mate i mean that just really makes me sound like i get up to some dodgy shit at the weekends doesn't it well i have i have uh, prepared a little show reel of some of your marketing activity so it's fine we'll play that at the end all oh, right okay um uh worst I, I think there's a, just a few pet hates it's um you know being ill prepared um not knowing who i am and who we are as a business and fundamentally what it is we're after yep. um your confidence comes from comfort of knowing your subject matter right so you need to know your product inside and out you need you really need to have a good understanding of what my business is what my challenges will be um and how you're ultimately going to alleviate those pain points and help me well drive bottom line ultimately. So um, that, it's just a few pain points. I do recall one young lad so nervous that when he left the room, he told me he loved me uh, by accident. Uh, and I think he was just trying to say goodbye. He was like, bye, I love you. And it was like he was finishing a conversation with his mum. So um, I don't really have a worse sales experience. I mean, the, some of the things I really dislike are when uh, people who are pitching just take the piss. Uh, they'll look at your investors online uh, they'll read the headlines, uh, assume that, you know, you've got bags and bags of cash and completely forget uh, or ignore the word startup um, and then uh, basically pitch you, you know, uh, product development for an MVE at 2.5 million pounds, you know, and that's not even with an onshore team. So, you know, that I've had a couple of uh, relatively bad experiences. And, and what about good experiences? It's just, it's, it's the antithesis of what I've suggested, Richard. It's, it's literally just knowing me. I had a, a call recently and I quite, I put the phone down and bought from the guy within, within a couple of hours. Um, he understood that I'm in a recruitment uh, sector, but also uh, quickly identified that I'm actually a technology business with no background in recruitment. Um, came to me with, you know, sort of the typical ROI for both industries, helped me build a business case on the fly, uh, even tempered my enthusiasm uh, and help me, you know, pretty much understand what my potential ROI was, ROI was based on delivering and implementing a solution that suited. Um, and now I'm, I'm pretty excited to get on with that. So he knew his industry. He was confident. He um, he also told me to back off when uh, when he felt he could. So uh, as 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 most people know, as I'm, I can be quite uh, heavy-handed in negotiation. Um, so he, you know, he's quite happy in in coming forward and saying look, I've, I've done as much as I can. And to be honest with you, we're growing at such a rate that I don't need to take your business. Um, at which point I was like, shit, right, I better sign on the dotted hand before he doesn't want my business. So, you know, that, that, was a, that was a good experience. So you fell into the scarcity trap then? I did, I did. And you know what? He's got thousands left to, pluck, to, to sell. 
Alec, what about you? Some bad experiences? Yeah, there was this really dodgy CRM agency in Manchester. They were <laughs> shocking. Um, no, joking aside, actually, it was a flip side of a, a, a very similar thing while, while we met you. We were, um, we were looking for new CRM software. We were talking to, uh, we, we, we whittled it down to, to two possibilities. And one, we really, we, we liked both. They were similar. But when we kept going to meetings and at the end of every meeting, they, their target was another meeting. And every time you went to a meeting, the price went up. And then they added and they added and you thought, actually, I quite like this stuff. And you went on, they went, but you've got to have this silver package and that's another 40% on top. And you went to the next meeting and it went up and you thought, how the shit is this going up every time? And they, th- their process managed to absolutely destroy any chance of you signing up with them. Um, even though the software looked, look, looked as good as the, the opposition software, it was their, their approach. If they'd been, if they'd been front and if they'd come up and said, this is our price, um, it might have either killed it from the beginning because it was double effectively the other guys, or it, it, that, that transparency would have been good. It, you couldn't have had a worse sales process than this. It's like going to buy a car with a sticker price of 10 grand. And actually, by the time you come and sign, it's 20 grand. And you think, well, I'm not doing that. There's no way I'm signing up for, uh, I'm signing up for that. And it absolutely killed it for them. Um, they're a gigantic company, so it must work with others. Maybe, maybe I'm pickier. But I want I want to know the price ahead of time. I think I've been I've been taught that by SAS that I get to see the price pretty straight away, and it can't there can't be any bullshit around it. You've got to it's got to be it's got to be on the line. Yep. Um, best uh, we were we, we, again we were buying a, a, a bit of SAS software recently. We're quite good at doing research. Nailed it down to sort of top three or four. Got in touch with them. Uh, asked one lot for a demo. You know I thought it's pretty straightforward. I just want a demo. They won't give me one. They kept asking more and more questions by email. And I thought, well, I, I, all I want is for you to show me the software so I can say yes or no. I don't want a long demo, 10 minutes, and I'll know whether it's good enough. Um, then you can give me a price, then we can go away. I don't want hours of negotiation. We want to sign We want to sign a deal this week, and we want to get it live next week. They, they wouldn't do it. Uh, the, the opposition said, uh, yes, you can have a demo. You can, we can do it today. Um, at the end of the demo, they gave us a solid price. We said, we said yes. They said, we're gonna, we've, we've rolled training into the price. You can have your live next week uh, with training the week after. You're like, well, that's perfect. That's exactly what we want. No, no, no crap. Transparency in business and and a product that works. That's that's my personal pet hate in a, a sales process. Not just from experience a sales process, but when you're looking at sales uh, sales teams and like what they're they're doing to drive new business is when they have a sales process and they want to force people to go through that sales process and they're rigid with it. So that you have to jump through their hoops rather than... So in, in that example, you were well-versed in what you were trying to buy. You knew what their product could do, but you wanted a demo to see it. So you mm-hmm. could skip those first stages and not have to go through that. And they've missed a sale. So, yeah. okay. So next question. You both work in the marketing sector. So I know like you're both tech businesses, but um, Alec, your business works and you have a marketing element to it. Gareth, your business, you are heavily involved in the marketing within your business and you have the, the brand, uh, uh, the employee, employer brand elements as well. So, but you, you engage, do you, in, but do you engage much in B2B marketing yourself? So like how much of like when you are being marketed to, how much do you engage with that marketing? And I'll break that down into like some smaller questions so you can pick them off. So what kind of marketing resonates with you? What's likely to elicit a response from you? And I'll start with you, um, uh, Alec. So what kind of marketing makes you engage? It's got to be, it's got to be personal. It's got to, it, it's, it, it's got to, it's got to feel, it's got to feel good for me. Um, it can be a little risque. Uh, it can be, you know, I, I can be the 5%. I'm not, you know, I, I, I can be the, the, the smaller number in the thing. Um, uh, it's got. It can't be. It can't be traditional. Traditional corporate like marketing. It's got to be a little bit different. If you're gonna. If you're gonna grasp me as a new customer for a product that we have no. That we've not gone out to look for. Then you're gonna have to be. You're gonna have to be more explosive in how you approach me. And what about you, Gareth? Don't subscribe to any of it because it's all bollocks, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's too sat behind a flipping corporate brand logo uh not for me if i want to if i know that i need a solution i'll go and i've you know we're all old now right so we've really got good networks of of solid experienced people that we trust that have mentored us that have grown us as professionals so i i i lean on that and leverage that uh, massively um you know the recommendation to speak to yourself richard came from 
uh, a CTO that I, I trust implicitly who taught me absolutely everything I know about digital and tech. Um, so I've, you know, I've pretty much always engaged on the back of a recommendation. I will look at uh, competitors to it to make sure that that solution is fit for purpose, uh, to benchmark them sort of uh, informally against um, what market rates appear to be, uh, understand features and benefits of the, the varying solutions, but um, invariably it does come down to a recommendation and that holds serious gravitas for me. Do you, do you engage in any marketing channels? So not, not necessarily with the marketing, but like what channels are you active in or are you consuming content in? So are like, are like social podcasts, are you on email newsletters? Like are, there must be channels that you're kind of consuming stuff from. Like what are those channels? Yeah, sure. well, um, I've noticed uh, recently, which is quite interesting because um, they've, ju- they've, they've got in before me, but quite a few businesses are starting to uh, target people on Facebook as well. So I think uh, it start, it's, it's a better place to get cut through, right? When we're on LinkedIn, and, and you'll know, Richard, I spend most, the, the channel I consume most outside of email will be LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, but what I've noticed is that I think businesses are cutting onto the fact or perhaps have been for a while and I just don't use Facebook enough. Uh, that you can you can actually get some seriously decent cut through uh, because I'm sick of seeing that seven, eight different dog meme. And then all of a sudden up pops this SaaS based platform for, you know, the CRM solution that I'm potentially looking at. So, um, you know, F- Facebook's one channel that I've noticed stuff coming on with, not to say I've engaged with it. Um, I've got a almost like an OCD where I have to get back to people. I do not like letting people uh letting people stew so i will get back to sales approaches via my linkedin in, um, inbox um and sometimes via email as well um so i would say that if if you're going to pitch me you're probably going to want to pitch me in email and you better have a good a strong subject line that's either um really on point from a you need us because of this or it's got to be something bonkers like we would do like uh, outstanding bill or, you know, just to hi, hi, your house is on fire. Yeah. yeah. I've had a few of those from you guys. Thanks for that. <laughs> what, so I, um, Alec, what, what channels are you consuming? So like what kind of marketing do you engage with or channels if you're not consuming the marketing? Uh, as Gareth was saying, I've LinkedIn or all, all over LinkedIn. Um, uh, I see, I see stuff like you're saying on podcasts, Oh, sorry, on uh, Facebook too. And I listen to loads of podcasts, but they, they rarely market to me. It's more informational. It's, uh, the, the, the ads in them never seem to be quite targeted. And I think that's because I'm listening to US-based podcasts and the stuff's just a little bit um, American-centric for the adverts. So they don't, they don't target me particularly well. Uh, uh, but yeah, link, LinkedIn and link, LinkedIn business and uh, Facebook socially. So when, and back to you again, Ella, when you're looking for new products or services, what kind of research do you normally do? Like, what are the top avenues that you use to learn about something? So you said before, like, when you go to buy a SaaS platform or product, you would be well-researched before you get to there. What are those primary channels that you do that on? Yeah, um, and absolutely, picking up on something Gareth said, word of mouth, I ask people. Yeah. Um, I, that Though that often, there isn't always the breadth of information that I need from there. Uh, Googling things, finding them, uh, and online reviews. I know they can be played with and I understand how they can be played with, but they're a they they start to get there. Uh, and then we, we, we look at feature sets for products. You know, we've already identified the main ones. We know, we know what we want something to do when we, 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 when we go out there now. So we find it quite, quite quickly. Usually we haven't, we haven't struggled to find any, you know, good version of something. Um, I, I think we occasionally struggle on price. You know, you know what you want. There's a version out there that's fantastic, but it's, it's budgeted for PNG, not for a startup. Um, but usually, usually we find things, uh, ask for recommendations in Google. How is, how's the way you evaluate products and engage with businesses changed over the last year? So how do you think it will change in 2021? I, I don't think how we evaluate products has changed at all. I think we've always, we're, we're bootstrapped. We've always watched the bottom line. We've always been harsh. Um, we, 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 care, we care about the numbers. We care about a deal. We, we like to negotiate on stuff. We never pay asking. Um, and and that's not changed in 21. Um, I think I think going forward for us, I don't think it's going to change particularly because we've always had this, you know, we've always been pretty hard line about how we do things. So I don't I don't see COVID hasn't altered that for us. And the, the work from home thing hasn't altered that for us because we've always had this kind of in our DNA. So it's not there's not been a giant shift there. 
Next question I'm, is actually from um, somebody who couldn't make the panel in the end, uh, couldn't make the, uh, the talk. And I'm going to direct it to you, Gareth, because he actually mentions you by name. He also calls you weird, but uh, I think that's a, in this context is a, a good thing. Real weird. So great marketing. Uh, so it's from Andy Wadsworth. So great marketing can be unconventional, different, occasionally a bit weird, i.e. Carew or money supermarket, et cetera. Is there, and I think that's a great, like you've been lumped in with a pretty good brand there. So I think you've, you've, you've peaked. So is there a difference in acceptability or efficacy between a marketing campaign and idea compared with say a one-to-one -one pitch to a new customer? How far is too far in a pitch to a prospect one-to-one? -one? So you like, I'll, I'll distill that down a little bit. So in marketing, you can be quite wacky and like you can, it, it's your brand persona and you push it pretty far sometimes. How far do you think you can push that in a, like a one-to-one -one sales pitch? Because in your marketing, you're willing to show up in a PVC outfit. Would you do that in a one-to-one -one pitch? Oh, hell yeah. Why wouldn't you? I really hope that's the case. Because I... <laughs> I would. Why well, I... I mean, I've done some weird pitches in my past. Uh, you you got to know your audience, right? Um, I mean, our marketing is designed sort of to a, not appeal to a mass audience, but to divide opinion among a mass, mass audience, right? And then it's that 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 division of opinion that, that, that drives the virality of that post, right? Um, and plus, we just like having fun. I mean, shooting the, the stuff that we do. In a pitch, oh, I mean, you know your audience. I, I, if, I, if, I, if I sort of knew you, I'd quite happily turn up to a pitch with you in a PVC outfit. No problem. Um, but, you know, our, it's, our marketing is not for everybody. I've had some seriously big brands uh, contact me on the back of uh, some of our best performing posts last year, uh, basically telling me they wouldn't work with me. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not... I don't know if I should mention names, uh, but, you know, there's one big old tech beast that said they wouldn't use us and then one FMCG who's globally renowned and they wouldn't use us. But on the flip side, I've got the biggest tech business talking to me and, and, and wanting a demo. Uh, so, I mean, wh whatever you think is going to work. So before I move on from marketing, we sort of dive into the sales side. Um, Charlotte's asked a question on the Q&A. With LinkedIn, are you more likely to engage with a salesperson based on the direct message or the content they are sharing and posting? So I'll start with you, Gareth, and then I'll get both your answers and then we'll move on to sales. Um, I think that's a good question and I've not obviously given that any thought. Knowing what I'm like, I have to, I, I have this thing. I, I like to respond to people. I don't, I, I'm a big on expectation management. I want, I want people to know where I stand on something. If you've taken the time to, you know, uh, personalize a message to me. If you, if you sent me a blank email and it's quite obvious, like for example, somebody called me Gina rather than Gareth. Well, you know, I'm not going to respond to that, but if you've taken the time to, in, you know, invest a bit of effort into what it is that you're selling me, then I'll, I'll quite happily tell you, no, it's not in the right time. And maybe to get back in, in, in touch at a later date. Um, have I engaged with uh, content that's designed to sell to me? I can't remember. I can't put place anything memorable that has, that I have engaged with, that has then gone on to that, that has then gone on to sell to me. What about you, Alec? No, I think similar. Uh, approach me directly. Use you know know something about me. Use some personalization. Don't use boilerplate crap. Um, spell my name. Don't just pick my LinkedIn job title and stick it in a message. Um, it's all really obvious is that stuff, and it doesn't work at all. It's going to get you deleted straight away. Um, don't be a recruiter. That's a good way to sell to me. Um, uh, uh, and, and have something interesting and you've got you've got this really small period of time to to, to tell me what it is so make sure make sure you your first sentence you've said something useful about me and then you've, you've told me something about this about how it's going to change my world because otherwise it's getting deleted i'll accept your, con your connection on linkedin but i'm not uh, and i might I, I i might reply to you but i'm not buying your shit Alec, <laughs> as a business right we're we're a, we're a technology business operating recruitment how would we sell to you what would be my uh, line? I, I imagine a similar thing because you're not a recruiter. Um, I, I, I have a, a loathing a loathing of recruiters and tend not to use them. Um, so I, I think if you had software that, I was, that you'd want to sell to me, uh, when you just approach me and suggest what it does, how's it going to change my world? What's it going to do that makes my life better? Is it going to save me money or is it going to make it, make it easier? Um, you know, what's, what's it going to... Not, uh, not, not a feature sale, um, not it does ABC, but what, what it's applicable to me. Um, 
Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, hi, Alec, I'm not a recruiter. Yeah, that, that, that's a good start for any, any pitch. So one of the most prominent questions we get um, when we're talking about like uh, uh, from a sales perspective is how do you get past the gatekeepers? So the first question to both of you is, do you have gatekeepers that you kind of hide behind or like so someone to filter out the chaff? So do you use gatekeepers? Are they gatekeepers in your organizations? Not in mine. No, no I mean, not in mine either. We're open, aren't we? We're on LinkedIn. You can you, you can guess my email. It's alec at vanfinders dot com. Um, it's not it's not it's not tricky to get hold of anyone if you want to. Um, you know, there's no subterfuge here. Don't don't bloody ring me out of the blue though. If you want to get if you want to get me, send me an email or send me a thing on LinkedIn, uh, and then I can choose to deal with it as I want. Um, but yeah, yeah, no, um, no, no gatekeepers. I mean, if one of the lads gets of you in the office and can tell you're trying to sell some crap they might have a bit of fun with you but um no no gatekeepers here <laughs> okay so outreach and cold calls how do you like to be contacted so for first touch point which do you prefer email call or social who wants to take it first put it up uh, it's an easy one for me i'd say email or social um don't call me i don't answer phone numbers that i i don't know uh, if if i've dealt with you i save your number i know you by name um, if you can call me, I, I mean, I, I put my details out there because I like feedback. I need feedback. Um, it's just something that you know our, the tech businesses are built on, right? So uh, all of my contact details are out there. But generally speaking, don't call me. You you get a better chance if you if you sent me a text message. Um, probably that, actually thinking about it, that's a bloody good idea. Send me a text message, um, email me, or probably uh, LinkedIn message me. SMS is an underutilized channel. Like, and when you get an SMS, you're hardwired to open it up. That's why messaging works so well. How about you, Alec? Similar. There's no, I mean, it, uh, approach, uh, approach me by, by something where I can read the text. Don't, don't ring me up. Um, if we, we use to, to, to get around gatekeepers, we, gatekeepers, we use SMS. We, we, we do that as a process. We send people text messages because it works. People read them. It doesn't mean they're de definitely going to answer your phone call, but they're much more likely to because you know who's at the end of the phone. You know, if you sent me a text message first before you ring me, then there's a chance I'll answer it. If you don't, it's very li there's very limited chance of me answering that, that phone call. Two, two questions in the, the chat pane. Uh, the first one from Matt Kirk. Why not calls, Gareth? Why would you not answer them? Because I... We're all busy, aren't we? Like, and generally speaking, whether or not it's mapped out in a diary, you, you've you mentally allocated time for certain tasks. Um, if you're one of those people that struggles to um, focus and, and, and stick to a task, then you'll never get anything, never get anything done. And I've learned that the hard way. So, um, so I haven't allocated time for a conversation. Um, even, you know, uh, it's, it's, you're just, you're just not going to, you're not going to tweak my interest. I, I will literally tell you, look, you need, to, you need to email me and we'll book some time in um, just so that I can, because I have, I, have, I have a routine, I have a structure uh, and I need to allocate time to give it some serious thought. Otherwise, when you're spouting stuff at me, it's going to go in that ear and come out of that side. Uh, and people know I'm terrible for that. And uh, the next question on, in the, the chat as well from Dave is, would you consider uh, answering WhatsApps? Yeah, yeah, I would, yeah. Yep. It would be it be pretty much send me your email address, send me your product, and I'll have a look at it and I'll get back to you. But I, you know, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be opposed to it. I wouldn't think feel it like it's it's it shouldn't be used as that channel. But but Gareth, you feel like it's a, a personal channel. Yeah, I think uh, for me, I do business out of it. In fact, um, some of the strongest relationships that we have uh, in terms of um, delivering that ongoing support and management for our. Uh, our employers is by creating WhatsApp channels, uh, WhatsApp chats rather. So I'll always create a WhatsApp chat, but only if it's accepted by people. I'd never approach them cold because I think we we spend a lot of our lives in 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 WhatsApp, and generally that's with family and friends. So for me, that feels quite a personal space to invade. Um, but by invitation, yeah, certainly go for it. Can you guys think of any any examples of messaging that caught your attention and resonated with you? So like you you responded it to so you you mentioned like emails and like LinkedIn being a, a preference for uh, connection. Can you think of any examples of good examples that have then got you to respond and engage? So yeah. I'll, I'll look first. 
yeah it wasn't uh, it, it wasn't business so much but there was a chap i used to do some mentoring with he approached me he approached me and said look I, i've read read something about what you've done i'm doing this thing can, can we uh, there was some personal stuff about it that you know so he obviously understood me uh, and he said are you willing to willing to spend a little bit of time just talking to me occasionally about what i'm doing and it worked really well and it would work in the sales environment too because it's just it was just personally he had something that he wanted to do he was nice about me and uh, and, and that was it and it, it, you know it was it was a decent approach the, um, I always find on those approaches, if, they, if they're if they quite clear with what they want and there's a reason for both of us and they've obviously done the research and they understand like how I can help them and how they can help me, then I'll always reply. Like it, they will always elicit a response. It might be a yeah. no, but they will get a response. How about you, Gareth? I can't honestly think of a necessarily of a sales message but in terms of getting me to get my attention to drive a call to action um go with a hustle yep. magazine out of the us that focuses on tech businesses and share dealing and all that sort of good stuff um i signed up when there were just a few hundred people big years ago and i've never forgotten um that in order for me to confirm my email address they literally called me a jerk um and i was like what the like, why would you do that? So, you know, it said, look what you've done, dot, 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 you absolute jerk. And then I opened it and I was like, this is absolutely phenomenal. And I have pretty much, I can remember that email, like word for word. Um, and, you know, that's something I've taken forward into our style of emails. It doesn't always work. Um, you know, just today I've had a, a, major, a major media agency contact me because when you share a candidate profile internally in your organization, you can share candidate details with hiring managers. One of the sharing emails, which I completely forgot we'd, we'd, we'd done, was, uh, um, hey, your, your colleague's calling you daft. Oh, no, you're, you're daft if you don't hire this candidate. And they've sent that to their like, COO, and she's kicked off and said, is this the sort of stuff they send out? Um, you know, but, but by her own admission, when I got her on the phone, she, uh, she said, it did make me open the email, though. One of, one of your emails makes me laugh. Like when I get it through, it's the one that, um, hey, your colleague fancies you or something like that. Yeah, so you've been invited like, to the platform. What the fuck is going on? Yeah, yeah, that's our invitation. So somebody invites you to the platform, basically means they fancy you. Have either of you got any, and, and you might not, um, and you don't have to name names if, if, if you don't want to as well, but have you got any horror stories of uh, like bad outreach, like where somebody has got done a, a really bad job and it's kind of either offended you or driven you to respond because of how bad it is? There's a lead gen service. Oh, sorry, after you go. No, go on, Alec, you go first, mate, go on. There's a lead gen service that, that, that must approach me every week or every other week. Um, it's like they just they just must go straight through salespeople, and they and it's terrible. It's always the same bloody stuff, and no matter how. Lead forensics. Yes, those buggers. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Come on, everybody knows that. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and no matter how much you tell them to sod off, they just get another person to contact you, and you think this, this shit can't work. Stop it. It's I'll buy from them when they email me to say you're now on your 718th salesperson from Leeds. <laughs> forensics. How about you, Gareth? Yeah, I think I think that's a bit of a. It's a bit of a kick, isn't it? You know, constantly uh, hammering. Um, that's that's pretty poor. Um, I think I think like just general blanket automation is a bit is a bit naughty, especially if you're going to get my name wrong. Um, I'm I still have fun with um, recruitment agencies. I mean, this is not them selling to me. Well, it is. In technically, it is because you know they've pulled out some keywords from my. Uh, my LinkedIn profile that me that, that makes me applicable for the personal assistant role uh, to an MD, uh, and then they've emailed me. Or I still, because I've run tech teams, I still get people saying, "Hey, we've got this junior developer role that you're looking for." And then I'll go back and say, "Hey, this sounds really exciting. Which part of my CV did you really like? Was it the 17 years in PHP development, or um, you know?" And I never get a response. Um, so I, I think those are terrible approaches because you, yeah, it's, it's basically what Alex is saying. You've not, you've just not understood me. You've not done your research. And quite frankly, I'm just a number to you. So the, the podcast that I do with um, uh, Joe from the Marketing Meetup, we, uh, we got outreach the other day from a uh, women's bikini brand who she's obviously, I don't know where she's managed to get our contact details from, but we're part of a blanket email and she's asked us to be brand ambassadors. So we've sent back and given her the outfits that we want and she's not replied yet, unfortunately. So. <laughs> I follow that up. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely will. <laughs> 
Of course. We gave us sizes and everything. <laughs> um, okay. So salespeople. So you both employ salespeople. Um, what traits do you look for when you hire your own salespeople? I think, I think hiring salespeople is one of the trickiest things we find in business. Because um, anyone who's halfway decent at it can sell themselves in an interview. Yep. You know, so they can they can tell you they're good at sales. So they can sell themselves. And it's very hard to break down if that person that you've interviewed is the person who's going to show up on Monday. Because um, there seems to be, there seems to be a, we found a decent fallout between the two of them. The person who comes to the interview and sells themselves as a fantastic salesperson that you believe isn't the person who shows up and is going to ring people on Monday morning. So we, we just changed our process. We made our process longer. We have extra steps in it. We have tests. We, we talk, they talk to more of the team. Uh, we just, we just make it more, more ingrained. And we're looking for like a cultural fit as well as, a, you know, there's, there's more to, than just some, some hard nosed hunter killer salesperson. You need to, that, that's, you know, we're not in the 1980s. Um, it's a different thing now. So uh, we, we look for the softer signs as well. You know, are they going to fit in the team? Are they going to do all that sort of stuff? And, uh, uh, and previous experience is a good, a, a good marker, but it's not everything. Um, and it's tricky. It's like this level of pushiness you need without being too pushy. We're dealing with, we're dealing with really large brands and you can't go in or cock and ball like you're flogging cars to somebody. You've got to be more nuanced than that. So it, it's tricky. I, I want somebody as pushy as hell, but isn't pushy as hell at the same time. I'm, I'm only saying this because he's on, he's on here, but you're not talking about Charlie there, are you? No, not at all. No, no. There's, there's more than one of my sales guys on this watching. Um, <laughs> Charlie. Um, he, he's asking who. Anyway, so, uh, and what about you, Gareth? What do you look for when you employ salespeople? Um, I think I think salespeople should really do a good job of asking the right questions. So, you know, if we sit down and, and it's me leading the conversation, that's a worrying sign. Um, I think you need, you need to ask a number of different questions. Uh, questions because ultimately that is then going to inform how you pitch yourself to me that's your product that you are your product and you should be able to sell yourself um in a variety of different ways but you need to understand what it is that i'm looking for and then and then tailor it to that uh i would like to know a bit about performance you know uh targets and stuff you can bullshit those um but you know if you can articulate them quite fluently and pretty quickly and you can answer questions on them then it shows that you know your numbers pretty well inside and out um, so I think for me, I, I generally want to get a feel for whether or not they're curious. Uh, so how, you know, do we just go for brands that are hiring? Well, no, we don't just look at brands that are hiring. What about brands that are scaling and growing? Or if we want a candidate acquisition, what about brands that are not just, you know, operating now where there's um, a bad ethos or a bad culture that we know about? But what about brands that are potentially going out of business? You know, so it's, it's, it's having that dynam dynamism from from a thought process in terms of you know are you curious and then i think something that's key key with um key with sales people is persistence so how do you demonstrate that persistence alec um dave's just answered this and the question based on your answer when does pushy become pushy like too pushy i think that's tricky um i i think the devil's in the detail then you know when you, you you're doing it you've got to you've got to push to close something but if you push too much that thing is not going to close it's going to go away um when i when i used to be a used to be a contractor in a different life. I used to, um, towards w w when I got really good at it, you know, I did doing like 40 or 50 interviews um, and you'd get the interview and you'd know they need you to start Monday. So I'd start, you know, I'd ask towards the end of the interview, you know, I wouldn't wait for them to make a decision after I'd left the room. I was getting them to make the decision in the room. Um, but that, that, that pushy becomes, that, that backfired a couple of times. Um, and I think it's, it's tricky. You need, to, you need to be able to read the, read the room you're in to decide how pushy you can be. So I don't think there's one answer there. Okay. When buying or purchasing in your uh, your business world, would you prefer a deal with uh, to deal with a corporate salesperson with a little personality or more of a human salesperson showing personality if they were both equal in terms of knowledge? So, would you guys prefer prefer more of kind of like a more I would say more straight laced or somebody who's more kind of relaxed and human in the approach? And is and and to add to that actually, does is that then determined on what you're buying and what kind of process you're going through or do you do you have a stereotype of or not stereotype uh, like an archetype of a salesperson that you like to work with regardless of what you're buying or do you want something more straight laced because you're you're buying something that's a higher ticket value do you change what you want in a salesperson when you're being sold to i think i'd like to deal with their love child if i'm honest <laughs> i think i think i want the bluntness of somebody who should you know, who, who in theory, I suppose you could deem as corporate. 
Yeah. Um, but then relatively relaxed. Um, I mean, ultimately, if a salesperson isn't a people, people and human and welcoming and has the, the correct body language to make you open up and feel comfortable, maybe, you know, my big thing is, do you create a personal connection instantly with that person? I always looked to try and find, you know, whether I pick up one back in the old days when we used to sell billboards and stuff, you know, those things do exist still. Um, you know, we used to try and listen for things on the phone. Uh, to hear what was happening in the background or whether or, not, whether or not somebody had sneezed or coughed and then use that as a, as a means of getting a giggle. And we know that if that person is open and warm, well, they're going to be far more receptive to the conversation that's about to ensue. So, you know, that, yeah, I, I, I'd like a bit of both, if I'm honest. I, I really like the person that I dealt with recently. They were, um, they were direct. They didn't give me any bullshit. They gave me the numbers I was after. I was after they gave me, uh, they helped me build the business case on the fly. And they told me to, do one at the right appropriate times. So, you know, for me, that was probably the love. I've probably met the love child of the people you're talking about. Hiram. Or her. Alec. Uh, similar, I think. Um, I, I don't think it alters based upon how much money we're spending. Um, you're buying, you're buying the person, you're buying the relationship. Uh, I think I'm buying into the, the, the company's ethos that I'm buying into in that person. I think I, you know, there's like, you're demonstrating what I expect everyone else to be like from, from here on in. Um, and, and I want, I want humans who are available rather than some sort of bloke in a suit um, who's, who's following a script, who's trying to go, going back to that thing I was talking about earlier, that the CRM company, they were just following this script like this, you know, this meeting, that meeting, the other, and it just destroyed things. You need, you need to be able to see that each sale is a potentially different sale and that the hoops you're going to have to jump through are going to be slightly different. And some people, so sometimes I want to make a quick decision. You know, you usually, usually I know that I want the thing you're selling if I've approached you, but if you've approached me and we're there, once, we, once we've gone past the needs, I, 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 want, I want to close it quite quickly. I don't want to cock about. So I need you to be efficient and listen to me. I don't need you to be following some script that some guy who's not in the room set up for you. I think, yeah, be aware of your audience as well. Like when I was at Manchester Airport Group, we used to deal with, you know, many of the big four consultancies um, and they re religiously, they would turn up in suits, right? Suited and booted. Uh, but we were setting up a new digital agency to, you know, Mago to be part of the airport. Uh, you know, and we had one of the big four turn up one day in like their, it wasn't even their cool digital clothes. It was like their dad clothes from the weekend, like trying to blend in with, with, uh, and it just, I mean, it would have been funny if they turned up, in, it wouldn't have been funnier if they turned up in PVC. Um, so, I mean, the whole office, the whole floor was just howling. Um, so, yeah, try not to be too contrived with it. So for, for both of you, what makes a good sales process for you? Like what are what are the like the key elements in a decent sales process then? Uh, it's it's going to be fit for purpose. You know, what, what you're selling can be different depending depending on what you're doing. How, how, you know, if you're selling something that's super integrated into a business, it has to be longer. You have to find more information out. If it's something that's additional and small, it can be quick and simple. Um, there, there is no one size fits all, I don't think. You've got to, um, you've got, you've got to, and you've got to make it personal for the person you're trying to sell into um, with some, with, with caveats about it, you know, getting all the structural piece of information and things like that out. And I don't, I don't think one size fits all either across businesses or within one business selling to a, a brand. Yeah. I uh, just no bullshit. I know, I know that, and that's, that's now, now become a cliche, right? Especially on LinkedIn and people's profiles, but quite literally just, let's just be very direct about it. I have a need. You have a product that you're suggesting will, 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 um, address that need. So like, let's be clear on what the KPIs are. How have you performed in similar industries or uh, comparative in industries or in the same industry? What can I expect of it? And what's the realism of achieving that? Um, yeah, and, and try your best to, I think the best salespeople will ask all of the questions ahead of, the, ask all of the questions of themselves ahead of that meeting. So your answer should just roll off your tongue because you already know what Gareth's going to ask you. Right. Last question for me. And then we've got some from, uh, from the um, attendees as well. So what's one thing you wish salespeople would stop doing in 2021 and start doing instead? And likewise for marketers, Alec, you first. Um, 
for marketers, stop stop flogging stop flogging the features. I said this earlier, but stop stop start selling the problems. I saw this fantastic ad shop if I did, and it was, it was I think it was somebody who had a little store and they were wanting to sell online and they were they went through the issues they have with selling and you can do this easily on the store. But they, they were showing they were showing how it helped this uh, this lady actually sell online it didn't it didn't say we do this and you can sell some shit it said we're helping we're helping sue sell her shit online and it was a much better approach to how to do it um but you still see these old ads going my product does abc and like i don't i don't care that's not i i'm finding it hard to grasp that because you know you've only got my attention for such a small period of time don't don't waste it on on, on the wrong thing charlie charlie sums it up quite well there sell the sizzle not the bacon what about you, Gav? Uh, what do I? What do I don't like? Yeah, don't don't do the small talk. I haven't got time for the small talk. Like, sell me the dream quickly. Uh, grab my attention and book in some time. Um, that's 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 what I expect from salespeople. Um, from marketers, I don't know what I expect. Let's just be a bit more human about it. Uh, you know, like the, the way that we run our, our marketing is to put our people first, because if, if I can if I can make David famous, who deserves to be famous because he's a top bloody guy, he's he's only geared towards over delivering. Uh, he's got nothing but love for, the, for our brand and for the people that he deals with. And he genuinely wants to go above and beyond. That's more important than my logo. Right. And, and, and if we believe this mantra that people buy from people, then why aren't your people in front of your brand? um so I, I just think we've got to make it more human um and i think i think alex right as well like stop talking about yourself and your features and start talking about my problems that's going to resonate yep yeah one more thing there just that you go okay, okay, me think of don't talk about you as a person I, I don't give a shit what you had for breakfast what color your dog is and stuff like that usually you know it's nice if your dog runs past and we, we've, we've found a nice point of interest but usually I, and i don't care how long you've worked in this industry it's not relevant um your your story isn't that exciting to me i know it is to you but don't don't sell me you sell me your thing i think great point both right so a couple of questions from the floor so what are your thoughts on meeting links and emails so i'm assuming that's from a cold email so somebody sends you out a, a cold email and it's got a meeting link in it how do you feel about that very tactical question Ooh, i don't know I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm not sat, I'm sat on the fence with it. I know like our team likes putting them in. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit holding it. It's a bit assumptive, isn't it? You, you, you think I want to meet him with you. Why do you think I want to meet him with you? And I don't know if that's me feeling like feeling like elitist and that you should make the effort with me. I don't, I don't know where I, I sit on the fence with it. Like, I suppose, I, I suppose I'd defer to show me the numbers. Like if it works, let's do it. And if it doesn't take that shit out. Yeah, I think, I think I'm similar. Um, but I, I definitely used one. I used one the other day, you know, cold email where I booked a, booked a meeting off the back of it. But I think I was interested in the product. So, so maybe maybe my selection is based upon how, how well the rest of the email is. If it's good, then I might use it. If the rest of the email is dog, then I won't. So like my, my perspective on that, these aren't my questions, so I'm going to jump in and answer as well now. So my perspective on that is that I feel like when it's a cold outreach, I would rather try and start the conversation and then try and book a meeting off the back of it. So if I can elicit a response and then move into that, try and get the meeting booked frame, I think the conversation is going to be much better for both parties because I've also had the ability to qualify whether or not there's actually a need there because otherwise you could end up with people who are going to book meetings that aren't actually relevant to you anyway. Um, so I think that kind of, it, it flies both ways. Um, a, a question from Sam Skelding. Do you think being in a business headspace really exists on social? Gareth mentioned noticing how business posts can cut through the uh, plethora of memes on Facebook, but hasn't necessarily engaged. What messaging or approach would bridge that gap? And can this idea of going against the flow work on any platform where you might not expect to see that business or marketing content? It's a big question. I'm not sure. I yeah. There's a lot of words in there. Yeah. yeah. So, let me see if I can distill that one down. So what messaging or approach would bridge the gap? And can this idea of going against the flow work on any platform where you might not expect to see that of business and marketing content? So you're advertising on Facebook. There's a lot of memes out there. Is there a way to take your business message and not make it entirely jar against the memes and other drivel that you get? shared on facebook is there a way to bridge that gap 
Well, I think you, I think you will get engagement on the likes of Facebook. So I don't, I genuinely don't believe that decision makers switch off. I just don't, I don't think, I don't switch off. So if if you get me at nine o'clock at night on Facebook or whenever it is that you'd have to ask Facebook when I go on, I don't know. Um, but um, if if you if you manage to, th- there will be a way to bridge that gap. And you will be able, I mean, like I said, you've captured my attention. I've seen a few different brands all in all selling technology products, all that relate to my business. Um, would I engage with them? I don't know. Perhaps I'd have to be thinking. I don't know the answer to that, Sam. I'm not going to lie. I think it needs to be more playful. I think it needs to fit fit in slightly better with the uh, with, with the surrounding than it would. Than it would so I, I may, may, maybe I'd have a different approach on uh, Facebook to LinkedIn or to Twitter you know there's just a slightly different different nuanced feeling there uh, and maybe you take it further maybe there's like a way you could do it on YouTube or something like that but it would have to it would have to fit in well I think with the the, 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 the surrounding. Andy Lord question for you Gareth what's next for the videos for Carew and do they actually drive sales the singing on the last one was so bad I loved it uh what's next i don't i don't know oh well i do know what's next i know what's what's coming next week um and i'm glad you love the singing there's a hint um what's next i don't know um we we don't really tend to plan weeks or months in advance um we tend to wait and see what's kind of we might we might look at what's topical um and and then and then leverage that we certainly do that for like paid media assets and our our paid media gets super super good engagement um do they drive sales they drive inquiries and leads and then we convert those so yeah we we um we do we do all right out of those but i think there's certainly room for for improving that i think we're great at gener- generating the awareness it's it's moving that into maybe more of a, a consideration for the product i always get people ask me you guys are great with the videos what is it that you actually do uh, it's got something to do with recruitment and for me that's perfect bang right brilliant you know that we're we're in and around the fringes of recruitment. And um, what we've started to do now is um, we're still going to keep our usual style around uh, around the videos, but you, you might notice from the one that Andy is referring to with the singing being so bad, we're actually talking about product features. Now, um, I was a bit nervous about doing it around product features, but it's brilliant to see that people are calling out those product features and people are sharing it and pulling out the fact that this is a product feature. So... Uh, that's worked and we've also started being far more active on our brand profile which is a little bit more it's still Carew, but it's a little bit more about us rather than just us being idiots next next question i'm going to point towards you alec from dan vanderveld do you engage when salespeople name drop bigger companies they work with no, it feels, it, I don't think it helps. I think that probably pushes me away. It feels crass. And I don't think it, c- comparing, so saying Coca-Cola use your product, well, we're 25 people, they're 25,000. It's not relevant. It, um, t- telling me Gareth's company used my product is probably more relevant, but nobody's going to name drop either of our companies unless it's incredibly specific because we're very small and people won't know who we are. Yeah. Um, uh, so no, I, I think it pushes me away. It's just, but in, it's, but in that context though, so if, if you, so like, say I reached out to you and said, Hey, here's, here's Gareth, uh, like, here's somebody we work with. It's um, Carew and we've done this for them. And I think that's relevant to you because you're similar size company, similar stages in your, your journey. Yes, he does rec tech, but you are both in the tech space. So you probably got similar challenges. Would using a, a name drop in that scenario work for you because it has that relevance or do you just not care what's going on? No, I, I think that would. Um, but I think it's more it's more it's more you're calling out the MD of the other firm rather than anything else there yep. and saying this this company do this. But that's not how it bloody works though. No one does that. People say Coca Cola or PNG or the Halifax Bank use your your thing, and that's just not relevant. Yeah, we all get giddy by those big marquee logos. Yep. All right. Um, on the back of recruiting salespeople, how do you scale your sales team and keep the messaging the same across the whole team? What would you do if you saw someone in your sales team use over automated emails, calling a prospect the wrong name, that kind of stuff? Who wants to take that one? Oh, it's a sackable offense that well, you wouldn't have been hired in the first place. So prevention rather than cure on that one. <laughs> um, keep your sales people, keep your sales people happy. If you haven't got a salesperson that's asking for more money, you haven't got a salesperson, right? So keep them, keep them happy. Good salespeople are hard to come by. Um, and do everything you can to keep them so that you don't have to go out and recruit again. If you are scaling, then you're, you're, a, I, I, I always question, are you looking to, um, 
to replicate the same salesperson. But fundamentally, I think people have different approaches and, and different things work. So I think, that's a, I think that's a fantastic question, by the way. I think it's hard to, it's hard to know how to scale, but um, definitely want to retain good salespeople. You don't want to lose them. How do, how do you keep salespeople happy though? Is it just, is it just pound signs or like, how do you keep them engaged and happy? And I think Alec, that's probably a good question for you because you guys have a great culture. You focus a lot of, on the culture and you've kind of built that, that nucleus of a team that is from the outside, at least looks like a strong, almost family unit. How do you keep salespeople engaged and happy? I, I think there's all the stuff that goes across a, any member of your staff, not just salespeople. You know, it's not specific. It's about it's about share, sharing the vision forward, listening to them, letting them have a degree of autonomy within their things. So to, to answer to the question we were just talking about, um, we have a way we want to do it. But if you want to be slightly different, that's fine. It, but uh, but if you're going to misspell people's names, you're probably getting fired too. I mean, that that is that's not acceptable. But you've got to you've got to treat people like people you've got to hire clever people who are going to do shit and let them get on get on with doing the shit that they've been hired to do you can't you can't micromanage you can't treat people like kids you've got to we, we find because we're all at home now lots of us were at home anyway but we have regular video calls a sales team have a regular video call we have all hands sort of town town hall style meetings every couple of weeks so everyone's aware of what's happening in the wider company and i think all that that sort of communication stuff is really really useful so you just touched on on video there quickly. Um, so I'm going to dig into that a little bit deeper because we've got a question on it. So it's not coming from me. But uh, what are your thoughts on video outreach? We do it with mixed results. Yep. Um, sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. I think it depends who you're selling into. I, I think if you're selling more into us guys, it probably works. If you're selling into the corporates, less so. Um, it. it I, I don't think there's a one size fix all, fits all there. Yep. Gareth? Uh, we've had some fun with it, um, but we don't do it really for I haven't done it really for outreach. But um, the good people at Six and Flow tell me that it's very, very valuable, uh, and that we should be doing it in LinkedIn messages as well. Um, so we are going to give it a test and, and see if that um, see if that works. How do you same so same same principle on LinkedIn? How do you feel about voice note outreach? How would you feel if if uh, like a salesperson called send you a voice note outreach it's something different that you probably don't get a lot of in your inbox but are they crossing over that line because they're putting their voice into your inbox rather than just a message i i well first of all like kudos for doing it like because that's a quite a big step right it's not you're not hiding behind words anymore you're actually letting a little a little piece of you go um you know the first time it was weird for me i'm not gonna lie probably weird for them too but um the second time was kind of like yeah this is this isn't so bad this isn't so bad but i suppose what what's nice about text is you can reread it in your own time voice notes are a bit like i've I've listened to it am i going to go back and listen to it maybe not um I i don't mind it i i like people trying new stuff and i'm not averse to uh engaging with it to be fair alec I don't think I've had it in a sales outreach thing, but if people send me voice notes instead of writing a message, I've had it a couple of times on, you know, like on WhatsApp and things. I, I find it bloody annoying. It feels lazy. It feels like they should have, they, they couldn't be asked to write it down. So they've done it when they're running for the bus because they couldn't, they couldn't spare me the actual time to do it. And it pisses me off. Um, so um, Matt, I, I can pick up that, that question with you on a specific framework for the stuff. And I, I'm sure we've got some like guides and content that can like outline that stuff on, on how to use um, video in, in messaging. Um, uh, Alec and uh, Gareth, we're, we're running out of time. How can people, if they want to connect with you guys or find out more about your businesses, what's the best ways for them to do that? LinkedIn. LinkedIn? So yeah, LinkedIn. Okay. Perfect. Um, Gent, thank you very much for being our first and uh, I enjoyed it. It was good fun. Um, hopefully we'll get you back in, well, maybe in 2022 20, and we'll, we'll start the year again and see how this year's gone. Um, <laughs> thank you very much and thanks for everybody who attended. It's been good fun and the video will be circulated after this if anybody wants to catch up on any of the points that we've covered. And if anybody's got any questions that um, you want me to uh, connect you with either Alec or Gareth, just reach out and I'll, I'll connect you with them. Thanks guys and see you later. Cheers. Nice fun. Thank you. Cheers, guys.